Hello, everyone. If you're new here, everybody who's clapping is my friend. And the reason why they're clapping is because normally you would come and see me leading you in worship at the very top of this service back here with the team. But this morning we flipped the script on you and I'm gonna be leading you in the word. <laughs> I feel like Adele, hello from the other side. Well, happy belated Valentine's Day. Okay, not all of you are excited about Valentine's Day. Maybe your Friday didn't go quite as planned. Um, I want to first acknowledge that my family is in the building. My husband is sitting here on the front row. My Valentine, wave babe so they can see you. My mother-in-law is sitting right next to him. Hey, Ma. My adult son is sitting over here. Wave, Kaylin. And Jasmine is somewhere in the building. I'm so glad to be here this morning. My little Taya is three. She's over in Kid Builders because if she was sitting down here, she would be badgering her father to come on stage with mommy because she would want to preach to y'all. And so I'm going to save you from that and just say to you whether you had a Valentine's with Bay, maybe you had it without Bay, maybe you were sitting at home scrolling through IG stories of everybody that was with their Bay. <laughs> I want to encourage you that there's a God who loves you and in fact believes that you are to die for. <laughs> he stepped out of heaven to do just that so that we could have eternal life forever. It's actually the greatest love story we've ever seen. Jesus is the Valentine of all Valentines. And today we're going to dive right into a story from the Bible that will show us Jesus's love in action. We'll find ourselves astonished at his kindness, his grace, and his willingness. We will see ourselves in this story, and we will hopefully leave here with a greater understanding of what it means to be cleansed by the king. That's the title of our message today. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your presence here. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and speak to our hearts. God, show us ourselves and show us your great power over sin and death as we worship together in your word, in Jesus' name, amen. For these next few moments, we're gonna jump into a passage from the book of Mark, chapter one. And if you would just do me a favor and pull out that virtual reality headset in the seat back pocket in front of you, we're gonna put these on and dive into the story. I like to put myself in the middle of these Bible stories. It helps me have a better context for what's really going on. And here we see John Mark. We call him by his last name, Mark. The author of this book, he was a disciple of Peter. And we know that Peter was a disciple of Jesus. So while Mark was not an eyewitness of all that uh, had happened and all the miracles that Jesus did, we see that Mark here is getting ready to tell the story that Peter has shared with him. The many stories of the eyewitness accounts, things that happened, Mark gets so fired up that he says, I have to write about this. You actually, the authority of Jesus is on me to write about this and I have to tell the church here in Rome. And that's where Mark was at the time. He says, I have to tell these Roman Christians so that they will know that Jesus is king. He is the son of the living God. He is the, the coming, he's the Messiah. And he's so quick to wanna to prove this point that in Mark we see, he skips over all the pleasantries. He doesn't talk about Jesus' birth or Mary and Joseph or Jesus' childhood. He, he jumps right in. He comes straight into the chapter talking about Jesus' baptism, all the miracles that Jesus did and how he walked around silencing the demons. You know, Jesus, he can silence demons. Mark's gospel is an action-packed thriller. It's descriptive and compelling. It's riveting. Sounds like a movie trailer. That's my favorite kind, on the edge of your seat. What's gonna happen next? And Mark has one, one goal in mind, to prove to the reader and all of us that Jesus is king. The text we'll focus on today begins in verse 40 of chapter one and goes through 45. I'll be reading from the NASB, uh, following in Pastor Brett's footsteps here this morning. 
So let's dive in. A leper came to Jesus beseeching him and falling on his knees before him, before Jesus, and saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean and moved with compassion. Other translations say moved with pity or even that Jesus was indignant right here. Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and he said, I am willing, be cleansed. Verse 42, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. 43, and Jesus sternly warned him and sent him away. He said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priest. Offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Verse 45, but he, the cleansed man, began to proclaim it freely and spread the news around of what Jesus did to such an extent that Jesus could no longer publicly enter a city, but he stayed out in unpopulated areas, some other translations say, in desolate places. And they, the crowds of people, were coming to Jesus from everywhere. Have you ever been on the outskirts in a desolate, lonely place? Ever needed acceptance and love but couldn't find it anywhere? Somebody wrote a song about it. Looking for love in all the wrong places. That was me. Looking for love, acceptance, healing, and wholeness in all the wrong places. Living in that desolate place, it's, it's not fun. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you're there today. Many of you have heard me tell parts of my story that I grew up in church where my parents were worship leaders. I had my first solo in front of the church at age three. I sang whenever I could get the chance. I excelled in high school sports. I was very proud of my moral stand as a good girl to save myself for marriage and stay away from the party scene. As I grew older, my parents' marriage struggled, and after 18 years, they divorced. Fresh out of high school, I found myself all alone, questioning everything that I had ever been taught. My first year in college, on a vocal scholarship, I got pregnant, and my whole world came crashing down. Shortly after I had my daughter, I got pregnant again with my son, now an unwed single mom. I had become everything that I said I would never be. Have you ever done that? I'll never do that. I'll never do that. And somehow, we become the very thing that we say we won't be. I had stayed away from church for so long, and I was so ashamed of the decisions that I had made because I knew better. But I also knew that something had to change. I knew enough to know that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So one day, I took my pregnant self and my seven-month-old baby, and I walked into a church. I came at the very end of praise and worship because I didn't want to be seen. I sat in the very back of the room, and I listened. But people saw me. One lady even looking at me up and down as if to say, what are you doing here, you sinner? I felt so judged and so alone in such a desolate place. I imagine the leper in our story must have felt 10 times what I felt that day. Since he is nameless in this story, we will call him a desperate man. Leprosy is a desperate situation. It eats away at human flesh. It causes damage to the nerves in your spinal cord. A leper was required to live in solitary confinement and most often died an early and excruciating death. In Leviticus 13 and 14, we see the policies and procedures that Moses had given an HR manual of sorts for lepers. They were required to yell, unclean, if anyone came anywhere near them. And they could never approach a clean person, lest they be stoned to death. 
They also had specific requirements for the sacrifices. They also had specific requirements and sacrifices to make for going about re-entry into society if they were ever cleansed. My brother-in-law grew up in Nigeria. And he tells me the story about being a little boy and seeing these lepers on the sides of the roads and on the outskirts of town. They were bent over and completely destitute. And hearing the voice of his parents say, don't ever go near those unclean people. They are lepers. You stay away. He describes them covering their face in shame and not wanting to be seen and not wanting to be part of society because they were so ashamed. The leper in our story is desperate for a cleansing. A cleansing from declining health and decaying skin, oozing and pungent sores, facial deformity and numb extremities. He's desperate for a cleansing. Have you ever been in a place where you are desperate for a cleansing from God? Where nothing else can satisfy, where no one else can help you, and your only hope is Jesus. Our leper, he's desperate for community for connection, for fellowship, for belonging. He had this intrinsic desire to be linked in. Can you imagine spending every day alone? No Instagram, no Facebook, no Bible, no home to go to, no family to belong in, nobody to call your own. We all have this intrinsic need for cleansing and community. I find it interesting that sometimes we think we don't need it. I'm one who for a long time loved the cleansing part. Yeah, Jesus cleanse me. But community, you guys can just stay over there. I'm good. My same brother-in-law who I told you about grew up in Nigeria came to the States and educated, became very educated, and some years ago he received a doctorate in genetics from Johns Hopkins University. He told me this story um, because he works with NIH to um, develop cures for disease. And so he's in the area of stem cell research, and before you stone me, it's not the bad kind. (laughs) He shared with me that If he puts one stem cell in a Petri dish by itself, he'll come back the next day and that stem cell will be dead. But he said, if I put two or three on the very far outer edges, they'll reach out and find each other. They'll actually grow toward each other because God has created us with an intrinsic need and desire to be connected in community. He said he'll come back three days later and they'll be like, he, he used the word, they go gangbusters. They literally, they, they rep- reproduce themselves at such a fast rate that within days, they've completely created this mosaic that's spilling out over the e- edge of these Petri dishes. By the way, shout out to Grace Cuff Small Group, Pastor AJ. <laughs> we grow better together. Don't stay in your Petri dish by yourself. Come on out and join us. But back to our story. This man is desperate for community. He's reaching out. He needs somebody to link with him so he can grow in his purpose, in his calling. And now we see this man getting ready to cut his losses. He knows I'm going to die from leprosy or I'm going to die for being stoned, because I'm about to approach Jesus. But either way, I'm going to die, so I have nothing to lose. He knows he's a dead man walking. So he beseeches Jesus, begging him, falling down on his knees. If you're willing, Jesus, I'm insecure, but if you're, if you're willing, I, I've made mistakes, but if you're willing, I, I'm, I'm marred by sin, but if you're willing, God, 
You can, you can make me clean. I know you can't, but I don't know if you're willing. This leper makes me ask myself, how desperate am I to bring my deformed heart and my sinful mind to Jesus? How quickly do I approach him in my shame or weakness? How much am I willing to give up to carry his name? Have I risked anything for the privilege of being brought out of darkness and into his marvelous light? See this desperate man's heart. Jesus sees it. He sees his heart. And he offers him a deliberate touch. We see in verse 41 that Jesus is moved with compassion. And I mentioned earlier, another translation says he was indignant. How can a person be indignant and compassionate all at the same time? The Greek word for this compassion and indignance, I'm going to try to pronounce it. Splach nizomai. Splach nizomai. Say that five times. <laughs> it literally means to be moved as from the bowels, like it comes from the spleen, splach, needs in my inside, my inner, my inner thing, I'm moved, I am, ah, uh, there's something, there's something. Jesus saw what shame and fear had done to this desperate man <laughs> who was made in his image. And he was moved with compassion. At the same time, he was indignant at what this sinful disease had done to this man. He was indignant. Is, couldn't anybody else help him? Where are the religious leaders? Why are they letting sin ravage people? Jesus was in a town in Galilee where he would heal whole entire towns. I'm sure he was like, I'm over this already. And we can relate because we're made in his image. When you hear about human trafficking, I don't know about you, but it makes me sick to my stomach. It makes, it makes me splach nizomai. It makes me want to do something about what I see. I have compassion on the one who's being trafficked, and I have indignance toward the traffickers. At the same time, about the same situation, I am moved and though I don't have the power to change it in an instant, we see here that Jesus does. And so he stretches out his hand and he makes contact. <clears throat> Jesus reached out his hand and he touched him. The Greek word here, which I'm having a lot of fun with, by the way, is hapta. It literally means to adhere to or fasten fire to a thing, to kindle, to set on fire. Wait a minute. Jesus set him on fire? I don't understand. Okay. Jesus takes the things. Now, this is Mark again. Mark is writing this. And I love Mark because he's so descriptive and he uses specific words to describe what he's trying to say. And here he's trying to say that Jesus takes the things that have been adhering themselves to us and he adheres himself to them, literally causing sin and disease to dissolve into him. He takes what is killing us and he kills it. He destroys it. Jesus is not afraid to touch our uncleanliness. He knows that this might be the first touch this man has had in years. And Jesus is not afraid to touch us. He's not afraid of where you find yourself. He's not scared of your sin. He wants to touch you. He's willing to touch you. You know what the Greek word is for willing? Willing. <laughs> Come release your healing. I know you are willing. Nothing is too hard for the hand of God. There's nothing too hard for him. 
Jesus sees our sin and our mistakes. He sees our failure. He sees our pride. He's still willing. Jesus saw me sitting in the back row of that church that day, living a lifestyle outside of his will and was still willing to cleanse me. He saw all of my weakness, all of my brokenness, and he was still willing to cleanse me. Why? Why? Friends, our King Jesus has a divine design in mind for each and every one of us. He actually had all of this planned out before he stepped out of heaven and took on human flesh. He didn't get here and say, oops, I didn't know you were going to sin against me. What am I going to, oh, what am I going to do now? No. He had a plan. He had a purpose. He created you for something great. And in our story, we see that even foreknowledge did not stop Jesus from touching this man. Jesus knew ahead of time what the leper was going to do. <laughs> he still cleansed him. In verse 43 to 44, we see Jesus warning this man, don't tell anybody. Listen, I don't want them to know. I don't want them to know. Just go show yourself to the priest. Let it be a testimony to them. We see this man doing the opposite. The man's like, I'm already cleansed. For what? <laughs> For why? <laughs> For testimony to who? I, I'm going to go tell it. So what? Jesus is trying to get to the heart of this leper and the heart of the religious system at the same time. For the leper, I think he knew that the leper had church hurt. I think he knew this man is so desperate. Coming to me, he must, all of his other options must be extinguished. He must have gone to the religious people. They must have turned him away. The text doesn't say that, but that's what I think. I think this man is like, I'm not going back to that church. That pastor said that thing, I'm mad. That leader made me feel all the way, a kind of way, I'm not going back there. Jesus wanted him to have an opportunity to go forgive, to get his heart right. Go show yourself to the priest. Jesus knew that I'd sit in the back of the church and hear the words he was speaking to me. He knew that I thought all the church leaders were hypocrites. I watched my parents go through divorce. Surely this is all fake. But I was there because I was desperate. <laughs> and for the church leader, Jesus was like, hey, go show yourself to them. He cared about the priesthood. He wasn't trying to, he wanted them to know, I'm for you. I'm not against you. I'm not trying to do these things outside of the law. I still think sacrifices need to be made. I, I want to maintain righteous order, but you got to get close to people to help them. You got to touch their, their dirt. This text doesn't say this either, but I feel like the man's excitement about being cleansed, coupled with the pride in his heart, kept him from obeying Jesus because Jesus told him don't tell anybody Jesus didn't need more publicity he didn't want people to follow him based on the fact that he could do a miracle that's not why he came Jesus saw so much need around him he couldn't help but touch it but that's not why he came Jesus gave this desperate man a brand new chance at life within community because of one deliberate touch. Jesus literally traded places with this man. This is the divine design that Jesus had in mind all along. It's an incredible foreshadowing of the cross. Before Jesus had your yes, he chose to die on a cross for your sin. Before he had your I do, he made a covenant with you knowing that you would cheat on him. He adhered himself to the cross, setting fire to death and absorbing it so that we wouldn't have to. He absorbed leprosy for this desperate man, yet did not contract it. He absorbs death for us, but never succumbed to it. He absorbed sin and never became a sinner. Sin and death were dissolved in and through him when he rose up from that grave. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
I left church that day cleansed from being touched by Jesus. His touch was not given because of my right living in that moment. His touch was given for my chance to live right. Only Jesus can offer this to us. Maybe some of you are here today. You identify with this leper. You're desperate. In need of a deliberate touch and wanting to understand or some of us be reminded of God's divine design for your life. Some of us need a fresh cleansing from our kink. No matter where you come from, what your background is, how much money you have, how great you think you are, how many mistakes you've made, we are all like this leper. Two things I know for sure. One, all of us have an inherent need for a touch from King Jesus. We are desperate for his daily touch. And two, we have a king who can and is willing right now to touch us. And if you would say, I need to know this Jesus, I need to know him like that, and I'm desperate. Would you just lift a hand? Hands going up all across the room. God, you see these hands? You see the desperation of hearts in this room? God, would you come release your healing? Your healing of our sin, your healing of our shame, your healing of our fear, your washing away of our pain. God, would you come? Touch us. For those of you who have never met Jesus, as we're eyes closed and heads bowed, just repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I'm just like the leper, and I'm desperate. I'm sorry for the way that I've lived. but I want to know you and I invite you to come into my heart. Cleanse me. Make me whole. Help me live for you all the days of my life. I want to be here. For the rest of you, if you'd say, I, I, I need a touch from Jesus, that touch. I, I have church hurt. I've been roaming around, can't find a place to call home. Everybody offends me. Church is just a hypocritical place. But you're here because you're desperate. <laughs> if that's you, if you'd say, I've been walking around with shame with my face covered on the outskirts in a Petri dish by myself. I need Jesus. If you would say, my body is stricken with disease. I've done everything, gone everywhere, been to every doctor. There's no hope for me. I want to encourage you this morning that hope himself is in the room. That his love and his kindness and his willingness towards you is so great. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious. Oh, precious. Precious is the flow that makes me white as snow, no other. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. God, you see every need see every heart 
you know the desperate places. And we are all together in this room as a community, as a mosaic, reaching out for each other and for you, saying, God, would you grow us and multiply us for your namesake? Make us what you want us to be.